hear it. Uh, for those who haven't met yet, I'm Stuart DeCue, the Executive Director of the Yale Center for Business and the Environment, uh, one of the hosts uh, for the conference here. Um, and welcome to the Pitch the Problem session. So as you may be aware and seeing from the kind of logos on the screen and then from the other material that's around, we partner on this conference with a lot of really interesting organizations. Um, and there are, there are people that we deeply learn from, that we appreciate, um, and they have very interesting problems or challenges that they face on a daily basis. Now, this session is about pitching the problem and why. Because if these people came to you with a solution, your mind would probably reject it. Right? Like, it's not going to fit for me. It's not going to fit for my community. This doesn't actually, like, see, fit the way I see the world. But, like, a really well-phrased question or a really interesting challenge is something that everybody else in this room can participate in or engage on. And so what we want to do in this session is we'll have these quick pitches. Right? These will be about like six minutes each from each of these organizations. And what we want you to do is be thinking in this moment of the questions that you'd ask. So I'll have a few rapid fire after each one of these from you all. But like, where's the place where the challenge that this organization has put out, I can help, I can support on, I can get engaged on. There's an aspect here that I have the ability to influence or make a difference in. Um, because a lot of the kind of multidisciplinary, multi-sector challenges that we face in the clean energy industry are not going to be solved or addressed by any one organization, but it's going to take kind of the, the high mind of a group like this to be able to pull it together. So we really want your questions and ideas after each of the pitches, but you'll see five of these in rapid succession. Um, so is everybody ready? It's going to be, we're going to move through these. They'll be coming up on stage, pitching quickly. Um, and we'll take a, a few questions after each. And if we have time for some summary questions at the end, we'll pull those out um, for the audience as well. All right? Everybody ready? Great. Come on. Is everybody ready? ready. Yeah. All right, let's go. Um, so first on stage, one of the key partners in Connecticut for all that we do, um, Connecticut Innovations. Drew from Kinetic Innovations is going to be having the, per the first pitch. No slides as well. So this is just like Drew in front of you. So Drew, come on up. Thanks, Dave. Mics. Yeah, the mics are off. All right. Um, hey, everybody. Um, good to see some familiar faces and uh, several new ones as well. Uh, so my name is Drew Delelio. I work at Connecticut Innovations which is actually the state of Connecticut's strategic venture capital arm. There are not a lot of organizations like this, but we are simultaneously a venture fund. Um, I help run our climate tech fund, which is $100 million. Uh, we're also, obviously, climate activist policymakers within the climate tech fund, as well as economic development and workforce development focused. We're trying to catalyze investment into early stage companies growing in Connecticut, jobs, manufacturing, helping us reduce our emissions here as a state. Um, so the problem that I'm going to talk about is how to move through the growing pains of building a climate tech ecosystem here in New Haven and in Connecticut at large. Um, so for those of you who have been in Connecticut for several years, you might know that you know we traditionally haven't had that big of a climate tech cluster. We've had some interesting innovation at Yale. We've been doing some cool things, but we really haven't had it built out established ecosystem that's growing and building a lot of companies. Um, so a little over two years ago, Connecticut Innovations launched this fund, which was the first dedicated effort by CI to capitalize a lot of businesses in our ecosystem. We also uh, built Climate Haven, um, which is an incubator here in New Haven so that companies in New Haven, within Yale, have a home where they can build their business, learn from advisors, um, and grow here. We also made significant investments in Yale. Um, that was talked about a little bit yesterday from the sustainability director, but the Planetary Solutions Group, as well as a lot of the engineering departments in the heart of physical sciences, have made significant investments um, in growing the faculty and building out the innovation within the university. We've also launched pilot programs to help startups co collaborate with utilities and corporates uh, and state agencies. We even have a talent office now within CI that helps our companies bring people from out of state to Connecticut, um, helping companies that are here find the right people that they want. So we have a lot to be proud of for what we've done in the past two, two and a half years. Our Climate Tech Fund now has 17 companies in its portfolio. Uh, Climate Haven has over 20 companies. A lot of professors 
are building incredibly interesting technologies. And increasingly, a lot of them are thinking about, rather than building a technology for the lab, how do we build it for the market? Um, beyond the things that we've done, I, anyone who's been here would also know that we have a great community of founders, of investors, of advisors that have really rallied around it. And anyone who's been to any of our happy hours or events locally, Climate Havens, Green Drinks, would know that what we have now compared to what we had a few years ago is really special. Um, but building an ecosystem is not a two-year project. It takes a long time. Um, and it takes a lot of people. And I'd say the two things that I'm going to focus on that I would say is the problem that I'm working to solve is trying to build this ecosystem is what is the growth stage infrastructure for an ecosystem of ours? And what is the story that we want to tell to ourselves, to our friends, to our networks, to people outside of Connecticut, to the region and national? Um, on the physical infrastructure side, we need a lot of facility space. We need places where our companies can build the physical things that they need in order to scale and grow here. Um, everything from prototyping equipment to wet lab space um, to manufacturing offices. We need more venture funds. Um, CI can't be the only quarterback in the ones that are around with us. We need more folks who are investing in our companies. We need more founders. We need more professors. We need all of them. Um, and we also need to have specific sectors where that infrastructure is dedicated to. If you're not from Connecticut, you might be from a place where there is a growing climate tech cluster in your city or your community. This is competitive. A lot of people want to lead the industries of the future and build a hub around some of these technologies that are going to be so important to our economy this century. Um, in Connecticut, we've really developed a few interesting clusters in water tech. Uh, climate Haven is working closely with the Regional Water Authority on new water technologies. We've also done a lot on carbon removal. We have a lot of faculty here working on it. We have incredible companies that are starting to spin out. We have a lot of professors at the Planetary Solutions and Earth Sciences Departments. We also have a lot of work in green chemistry. Companies like Oxalis Energy or P2 Science. These are the sectors, the green molecules that we need to manufacture that are going to help us get to net zero in some of the hardest to abate sectors in climate change. Um, so green molecules, for example, has been something that's been part of Connecticut's history for a long time. We were the original hydrogen and fuel cell cluster of the United States. We know how to manufacture. We know how to make things. And that gets me to the story of what we want to talk about as part of being in Connecticut. Um, and that's the story that we want to tell to anyone who wants to build a company here, to make it seamless, to make it easy, to make them feel like this is the de-risked path, not the risky path. But it's also the story about why to build here and not somewhere else. The competition is a competition for building these industries, but that's a competition for talent. And we want to communicate a message about why to build in Connecticut versus somewhere else. Um, some of you may have seen, if you're local, the billboards in Connecticut around how we make things in Connecticut. They've been doing a big campaign and branding around, oh, we make fuel cells, we make nuclear subs, we make airplanes, we make pizza. <laughs> <laughs> like the message is that we're the maker state and that's really cool. But the most powerful stories are our stories. The people who are here, who know people who are building here. It's the stories of that, like I said, that we tell to our friends that we hear about when other people are looking for success stories, that we have those success stories and that we talk about it. Um, so I'm going to wrap up there and just say that our ecosystem is, I'd say, like a seed plus stage. We're a seed stage, but we need to go into growth mode. Um, and anyone who's in venture capital knows that going from seed to growth is very hard, um, and we need to do the same. So for anyone who has ideas about how we could be doing better in kind of getting Connecticut to a place where it is a climate tech cluster on the map, um, would love to hear them and would love to talk to you afterward. Thanks. Great. Right. Hands, questions, ideas. How does Connecticut go from a seed stage landscape for climate tech to a growth stage? What do you got? Tax incentives. Lots of them. What kinds? Exemptions, uh, pilots throughout state level uh, siting agreements so that the local municipalities are benefiting from what they're allowing to essentially foster in their in their communities and seeing the direct benefits. 
you got to make it good for the local community so that they're looking to accept this new business venture and all of the tax revenue cannot go to the capital. It has to go to the local communities while still incentivizing our taxes are too high here. Incentivizing the companies that this is a better place. Uh, you ask me why why we're not exploring an office in Stanford? Taxes. All right. So we got tax incentives and credits. Other thoughts, ideas, questions for Drew? Yeah. Yeah. So I've been to Climate Haven, went to Green Drinks, and loved it. It was like the hottest ticket in town in New Haven. It was incredible. And then two weeks ago, I went up to Greentown Labs for the um, Clean Tech Open Northeast at you know the suggestion of a bunch of people in this um, environment to learn you know what they might be shooting for. And I went there and I was blown away, like what they'd achieved. Is that the vision for Climate Haven? To, and their partnerships up there seem to be between. You know, the educational connections, the corporate connections, the NWO, you know, connections were incredible. Is that the vision for Climate Haven? Somewhat and somewhat not. Um, I would say Greentown is spread across a wide canvas of climate tech, and yeah. a lot of their companies are very early stage. Yeah. I think we want to be a place that, and I'd say a lot of their sponsorships skewed toward the corporate side. Um, so a lot of their initiatives are also corporate driven. I think if I'm, I don't want to speak on climate change behalf, Casey could, but where we want corporates, but we also want government and nonprofits and a lot of stakeholders at the table. Um, and I'd also say like, we want to be focused. Like we have a handful of clusters and sectors that Yale and UConn and Connecticut have been historically good at. I think when we think about the future in a world where everyone is investing in climate tech, we want to think about like, what is our unfair advantage? And that doesn't mean trying to do everything in climate tech. That means trying to do a handful of things really well. Thank you. Yeah. Great. We're time for one more. Going? Going? Well, everybody, thank you, Drew. Scott from RWE, who's going to pitch the problem on how do we depoliticize clean energy in rural America. Folks were in the session here before. Charlotte was giving a wonderful presentation on the development aspects of this. And Scott, take it away. Thank you, everybody. My name is Scott. I'm a SOM alum. Uh, saying to Stu, we're not quite sure which year, but it could be between 2016 and 2018. <laughs> I took a leave of absence during my time here. Um, I am RWE's uh, head of development for the eastern region of the United States, overseeing solar, storage, wind. Um, I think we mentioned this yesterday. Uh, we're the largest energy company that nobody's heard of. Why do I bring that up? It used to actually be a pretty good thing. We could kind of fly under the radar. Uh, as long as the, the local benefits were strong, the issue was not highly politicized. So for utility scale solar, utility scale onshore wind, where do we go and, and, and site these projects? Is there a reason why you guys don't see giant solar fields close to the either suburban or urban areas that you live? Of course, there's not enough land, there's too many constraints, it's too expensive. So the, the geographies where we target these projects are rural and conservative. <coughs> I checked yesterday, so RWE has a 10 gigawatt operating portfolio of renewable assets in the United States. And out of those 10 gigawatts, 78% are in Republican-held congressional districts. Just to, to give you guys a sense of kind of the, the disproportionate amount of utility-scale clean energy projects that are located in, in conservative parts of the country. What we have found in the last, and I've experienced this personally, and what we found in the last, call it five to seven years, has just been a, a, a very changing political landscape where, if you guys were here yesterday for uh, Mr. Zaidi's remarks, transmission has become political. All of these elements that before were completely bipartisan, they were just viewed as, as infrastructure. And uh, unfortunately, my team has had three projects in the past year 
all of which were about to head for financial investment decision where we had spent millions of dollars on the development. We had embedded ourselves within the communities and largely due to, to misinformation outside uh, organizations that had kind of infiltrated local opposition with misinformation, those projects all died on the vine. And it is sad because in each of those counties, RWE would have become the largest corporate taxpayer in each. And there's a town, upstate New York, their budget is $400,000 a year. Our host community payments and the pilot we have with their the county's IDA would have amounted to about $700,000 a year on top of that, that town's budget. And when we asked them, you're surrounded by other wind farms. What is so different about our wind farm? The answer has been President Trump does not want, these are eco killers. We don't want this. We can't both be conservative and supportive of kind of MAGA politics and at the same time be supportive of clean energy. So in my mind, I'm uh, very much a, a realist, middle of the road politically. In order for this transition to be successful, we have to depoliticize clean energy. It cannot just be folks from the urban and suburban areas of the country telling rural America to accept this, that this is the change that's occurring. So. Uh, Highlighting just a couple of facts, 38% of Republicans say renewable energy should be prioritized, yet nearly two-thirds of Americans overall think that clean energy should be prioritized over fossil fuels. The political dynamic of rural America is not going to change. It's been like this for a very long time. Small town America uh, typically is more conservative than, than suburban and urban areas. When we look at the, the overall renewable landscape, the, the data speaks for itself. I mean, this is how we decarbonize the grid. Uh, it is an all of the above approach, um, and a lot of it is going to become is going to come from utility scale clean energy power, which nearly four fifths of solar and wind is going to have to be sited in these areas. So the question that we have for all you guys is, what do you think we can do to better depoliticize clean energy in rural areas that are going to be absolutely the critical part of at least our puzzle to solve, to achieve our company's ambition, which is to take $25 billion between now and 2030 just for the United States, just for our onshore renewables portfolio. So the money is there. The technical expertise is there. We talk about supply chain issues. RWE goes and buys billions of dollars worth of transformers, circuit breakers. Our projects are ready. This is a huge reason they're being held back. How do you guys think that we should try to solve it? I don't. I think you should try not to solve it because I don't think you can ever depoliticize local communities. So you have to... You know, my experience in working with local rural communities, you have to work with each one individually and figure out what their pain points are. And each one is going to have certain things they want, and you're an outsider. And rural communities have been abused over the last hundred years, so their feeling is you're an outsider, you're, you're a higher power, and you're going to take advantage of them. So you need to find what they want and give it to them. Because... You're not the first company that's had to deal with this. Amazon deals with it constantly. Uh, you know, industrials, other industrials have to deal with it. Um, gas stations have to deal with it. So it's how are you going to benefit us? What are you going to do for us? You know, we're, you want something from us. What are you going to do? So what I will say, though, jobs, jobs, infrastructure, you, you know, how are you going to help the school? That type of stuff is usually the big impactors. The, the change that we've seen is that it used to just be about dollars and cents. If we could communicate the, the economic value proposition correctly, that was the answer to the problem. And it has become, in specific cases, there's no amount of money that we could provide 
that would get certain local communities that are now opposed to renewables for political reasons to change their minds. And I think that's the issue. You're approaching it with dollars. There, these, if you're in a rural community, in my so experience, it's, it's not. They, they're there for a reason. They have pride being in a rural community. Dollars is how outsiders negotiate. Solve problems. Yeah. They want... Under, they want you to understand their problems and they want you to help solve their problems and then they'll listen. So there's a, a project actually happening at CBA right now. It's called Seeds um, and it's looking at um, within Connecticut uh, the overlap between solar storage and EV owners uh, across Connecticut. The biggest driver of like where did they see a lot of high concentration of those technologies is where there's a local ambassador. So really just like Again, going town by town, this is not a monolithic solution. It is finding the person in the community that is going to advocate for this on your behalf rather than you guys coming in and, and having all the answers and all of the science and all of the data. Like, that's not what matters. It's like, hey, our kids have grown up together for the last 20 years. Let's have a conversation. So what I will say is that for all of our projects, we have a, a local community champion. Um, that as somebody who's lived in the community for a long time, we're not just blindly throwing dollars. We will look through a county's general plan, try to understand where there are budget shortfalls. So it's not just, hey, this is a pot of money. It's, hey, we understand that there are two critical needs that the fire department is requiring, and this is where that money will go to. And those do seem to be steps in the right direction. In certain cases, it just hasn't been enough. And that, that's been kind of the gut punches where you think you're being really thoughtful. You are hearing, you, you see local support, and it, it still isn't, isn't always enough, which we know we're not going to win 100% of the time. Um, I think both of those suggestions are incredibly valid and are, are, are needed. That should be kind of the base case to understand the community's needs, find local champions. Are there other ideas that folks would have? Yeah, and this is a, a, kind of along the same lines, but um, you know, it's great to have really bright people from Yale and Columbia, like where I'm from, um, but having some people from Binghamton on your team and uh, having some people from Oklahoma on your team. And so it's not just the, uh, the community champion, but being able to have people that they can relate to that they are interacting with and so you are not the outsider with the big money you know one more i already spoke go ahead go ahead um so something that you and i have discussed so I say alex already knows like rwe's community <laughs> strategy yeah. so this may be map we're looking a lot into this and I think that the question needs to be shifted a little bit of depoliticizing because you're talking about blue and red when we've dived to, gone really deep into this and if you're looking at this just from a you know you can't build in red counties then you wouldn't see solar in Texas and so from our analysis it's those counties where it was 2008 Obama to 2016 Trump where there's big political swings and things get really polarized, that's actually where we see the problem. And so I think you need to, I think, you know, in Texas, you're seeing tons of projects because, you know, people know what it means to have energy projects. And so I think another key element is thinking about it, you know, that it, this isn't just clean energy infrastructure, this is domestic jobs, this is, domestic, this is just a, you know, an energy project, tax revenue. I mean, we've discussed this a lot, but I think there's those nuances that are, we think are actually really important. Great. Peace out. Excellent. Great. Thank you. about to play music. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Great job, Scott. Thank you. All right. All right. Continuing along this uh, theme, we got Macy Jones from Vineyard Offshore, who's going to talk about misinformation in the offshore wind industry. Thank you very much. So many whale deaths. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Macy Jones um, from Vineyard Offshore. We're um, based out of Boston and currently 
building a project off the coast of Nantucket, Vineyard Wind One, um, made a splash in the news cycle um, over the summer, but we also have lease areas in New York and California as well. Um, and yeah, so today I'm here to talk about misinformation. Okay. So, I mean, I wasn't sure if this was totally necessary because um, there's some pretty smart people in the room today, but um, just in case, what does misinformation look like? Um, misleading statements, cherry picking data to fit assumptions, false connections, and just straight up lying. Um, we see this a lot um, in general, like when you go to the grocery store and you see like the wall of, ooh, sorry, the wall, thank you. <laughs> um, Makes you feel important. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you see like the tabloids, it's like Taylor Swift breaks up with Travis Kelsey. Um, like that's misinformation. Um, a lot of the mudslinging we see in politics can be considered mudslinging no matter like what side of the aisle you're on, that's a lot of misinformation. So just um, level setting, I suppose, before we get into everything else. Um, so these are some specific examples that we've seen um, in offshore wind. And so I have a screenshot of um, the one on the, the right whales. They survive whaling, but right whales won't survive wind energy. We could say this is an exaggeration um, because most leading scientists will tell you that the largest existential threat to marine life and right, right whales specifically is climate change, our warming oceans. That's um, <coughs> affecting them far more than any offshore wind project. Um, we have on the other side, no measurable influence on climate change will result from these projects. This is from a group called Green Oceans. They're primarily in New England um, talking about this came from their arguments against the Revolution Wind Project. And so what's interesting about this one specifically is they say that the project um, won't have an impact on climate change. And so the reason I find this is it's like recycling. If only one person is recycling, then yeah, it won't have an impact on the status of reusing materials and that sort of thing. But when we have a whole bunch of people recycling, when there are tons of communities switching over and making it a priority, that's when the impact comes. And so their tech, it's, it falls into a different categories, but I don't know, it's just an interesting statement. Um, so who is behind the misinformation? Um, a really interesting study came out of Brown University that I highly recommend um, checking it out, where they mapped all of the funding that these local grassroots groups have um, and how they connect. This is just kind of like the chain. So local grassroots groups spread the information locally. Um, and then this infiltrates um, town Facebook pages, and then that's when it starts cycling around locally, and more people start to talk about it in that way. And so. These well-organized grassroots groups are the ones that start that cycle of information. And so then the next level up, we have coalitions and think tanks that are driving. Um, they're driving resources to these groups. They're providing them with the talking points. They're providing with the staff and resources needed to be effective in these communities. And then the coalitions are funded by people like the Koch Foundation, and um, the American Energy Alliance, which is petroleum and gas based. And so these are, so when you see um, a local group like Protect Our Coast New Jersey or something like that, where it just seems like they sprung out of thin air, it's, we're not really sure where they come from and how they're so well funded so quickly. Um, you can see it from, um, there are groups addressing misinformation. So one real offshore wind, um, this is a screenshot from their webpage. They're committed to not taking money from offshore wind groups so that way they can be a non-biased source. Um, I have Brown University on here because their study. We have the Conservation Law, Law Foundation, Union of Concerned Scientists, NOAA and BOEM are also sources that are trying to dissuade misinformation. But the biggest issue we're running into, even with these other groups outside from the industry that are every, the misinformation groups are ironically accusing them 
of being paid off by the industry. And that's why they're supporting offshore wind. And that's why they're ignoring the science and um, that sort of thing. And so my big question to you is what do you do when we're apparently paying off everyone from the government to these? Otherwise, my salary would be a lot higher. Um, um, I would love some of that money. But, um, and so what do you do when everyone's being paid off, everyone is ignoring the facts and ignoring the science, and the only people, my own grandmother is a victim of this, she thinks that the reason why the weather is changing in Massachusetts is because the wind turbines are blowing the air around. So it's, yeah, it's a problem, <laughs> even in my family. Um, so if anyone has any solutions for how we can address this, I'm all ears. That is a big one. All right. Thank you, Macy. All right. What do you got? Questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah. Fair game. Vote for candidates at the local level, the state level, and the federal level that have clearly come out in support of science-based decision-making. Right. Deep engagement in local legislators and elections. Very interesting. Yeah, right there. Uh, a plug to another Yale thing. You have the Yale Climate Communications, and they talk about, I think, six Americas, seven Americas. Mm -hmm. I think it's talking the language that people can understand. Mm -hmm. And I think many times all of us here... Energy is really wonky. We've got 3,000 acronyms, and then it tends to sound very Yale and elitist, and we need to break it down and use the proper language. It would probably apply to the panel right before this, too. If you're not using the right language, you're just you're not communicating with them. Other thoughts? Questions? Yeah, suggestions. Yeah. I think related. this is related to Scott's issue at RWE, too, where if you couch this potentially as energy independence and resilience, it, I think that resonates in the other parts of the country well. Because when you think about what helped fracking gain such political favor among that crowd, it was the idea of being free from outside sources of oil and gas. And that energy independence and resilience is a very sexy thing in a lot of different ways. But I think, and I think if you can show that, how that helps us be that, that might resonate quite a bit as well and defeat some of this, you know, talk that's ridiculous. Yeah, in the back. As much as you mentioned the Koch brothers and dark money, uh, we need to reverse that and bring in coalitions of different organizations and different funders to counter the Koch brothers. I mean, there are rich, progressive people. Uh, Bloomberg is one of them. Um, you know, there's plenty of other, other people out there. And that's what we need to do. I think all too often we fracture ourselves and we put ourselves, progressives fracture ourselves and put ourselves into silos. And those guys that you put up there, they're really good at this. And you know, all I have to tell you, two words, Yankee Institute, the crap that they put out is, is, is so well done that even I sometimes want to believe it. <laughs> so that's what we have to fight against and to make sure that our voices are heard above the Koch brothers. Any thoughts or reactions to the first comments from you? Uh, no, I think they're all like good solutions. I agree. I think um, Dems potentially need to put their money where their mouths are a little bit more. Um, and yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, one of the things we talk about a lot in like scaling climate tech companies, especially to industrial customers, is the Mr. Burns test, right? Which is like it, the money grubbing <laughs> capitalist, right, from The Simpsons, uh, needs to want to use your product regardless of whether it's good for the planet. And so I think changing the language helps a lot. We kind of talked about this in the last uh, session. Um, if you're coming in and saying, this is good for the environment, it's going to save the planet, people might say that they care and they might emotionally care. But really what they care about is, is this going to make me richer? Is it going to help my property value? Is it going to improve my kids' schools, etc.? cetera? Um, and I think focusing the language on this is a project that is going to make your life better and it, almost ignoring the climate impact of it when you're talking to individuals or when you're talking to corporate partners gets you a lot further uh, than telling them they're going to save the world because really day to day they don't care about that. we might in this room but time for one more Catherine um, I, I have a question for you um, you talked a lot about organizations and sort of both sides of the of, of the offshore wind, but you didn't talk a lot about the role of the industry and the industry's voice. You alluded to the accident that occurred this summer 
it's a new technology, things happen, but I'm just like thinking longer term. Like how does the industry's voice play into this ecosystem? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I left them downstairs, but at the showcase, I have um, a case study that we've produced about our commitment to protecting wildlife and that sort of um, in that angle of our projects. And, but the issue is, is we can put out those resources as much as we want to. And they do have a place in communities like this, where we have people that are already in favor of offshore wind. But when it comes to potentially new communities that we're speaking to, I don't blame people for having skepticism of believing materials that come right from the industry itself. It's kind of like a catch-22, because for the longest time, we were believing the oil and gas industries when they said that burning fuel, like fossil fuels wasn't causing climate change, and look where we are now. So I don't blame people for having skepticism and not necessarily believing our resources. So we do have a place, but it's, we do need the intermediary who can um, be that non-biased source that people can potentially trust that isn't the company that's trying to build the projects itself. Great. All right, thank you, Macy. Well done, audience. Keep it going. Um, all right, so I'd love to bring up Felipe from Modern Hydrogen to talk about my clean energy reality chat. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. So in good old fashion, I'm going to get personal, and I'm going to tell this story about the company where I work at in a personal way, and hopefully um, open a lot of minds here into either supporting us or just being more open to the type of work we do. So I came to Yale to pivot into clean energy, and I thought, you know, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a PhD. But, you know, there's a bunch of those in the clean energy space. They can take care of, like, time matching and super technical stuff. I'll just do whatever business people do, you know. Order Patagonia, please. <laughs> all that. <laughs> For the company. But as I dove deeper into the clean energy space, I really found, are we all really talking about the same thing when we say clean energy? And the answer, obviously, is no. There are two big camps in the clean energy space. The Fedding Bro Camp and the Green Idealist. The Fedding Bro Camp is really focused on dispatchability, profitability, reliability. They're okay with where our power systems are, and they're not opposed to clean energy, but they're just looking at the business case. On the other end, we have the Green Idealist. I think we have some of those in the room. Honestly, when I came to Yale, I was a Green Idealist, and we, we will not settle for anything less than carbon neutral. We want everything to be renewables, we want the future to be now. Here's where it gets interesting though. There's really a trade-off between how fast we can decarbonize and the level of decarbonization we're gonna get to. The Fit and Broke camp is somewhere down here. You know, they're fine where we are today, they're just happy making money. Well, the Green Idealist is somewhere up here, and we all can agree on that. We need billions, if not trillions of dollars to totally decarbonize our power system. We're gonna need, you know, more than 50 years probably to get uh, the grid completely clean. And this is where it really gets interesting. Everything above the fitting broke line is an improvement of where we are today. And everything left of the green idealist is really a missed opportunity space. This is where, you know, perfect is the enemy of good. And this is where nobody's willing to yield because for the fitting bro camp, anything above there is extra cost, just extra headache. Why do we want to deal with that if we're being legal and you know we're doing everything okay? And the green idealists say, you know, if it's not the perfect renewable energy, I'm not going to support it. I'm going to be against it. But that's really where decarbonization is going to happen in our lifetime. So they're against it. Anything there, they're going to shoot it down. But I think, you know, this is why I can't really be a green idealist anymore. Number one, it's not realistic. If we look at our U.S. energy consumption, and we assume that every uh, electricity generation and transportation is going to be electrified, which is a huge assumption, we still have 40%, which is the heating load, that 
nobody really talks about. How are we going to decarbonize that? And if we were to take all the renewable energy uh, projects that have been done, all the ones that are being built, and all the ones that are going to be built that are in the pipeline for permits, it's still not enough for that 40%. And number two, it also just impedes significant value creation. You know, one of the biggest things I look at is, is it going to be equitable? And probably not because renewables are very expensive. And is it going to be additional? Well, honestly, most of the renewables that are coming onto the grid are just adding more capacity because we're just consuming so much new electricity that the existing power grid that we have is not being decarbonized. Don't get me wrong, I, I still love renewables, they're great, we support them, but they're not a silver bullet. And this takes me where I work today. What we do, we're modern hydrogen, we're based out of Seattle, and what we do is we actually get natural gas, and using methane pyrolysis, we strip out the uh, carbon from the natural gas to produce solid carbon, and hydrogen. The hydrogen, well, hydrogen works for pretty much everything, so commercial, industrial use, on-site, fuel cell, electric vehicles, and the solid carbon comes out solid itself. So this little jar here, just kind of like powder sugar, that's what we're getting from our machines. And that can be used for paving material. Right here I have a plug of cement. This is an example of what we're getting from our machine. This is how it works. We go, uh, we're on the pipeline of methane. We start using some of that methane to turn on our unit. Once our unit is at operating temperature, we shut down that uh, CH4 to uh, operate it, and we start producing hydrogen. We get a slipstream of that hydrogen to continue operation, and we get the rest of the hydrogen to be used to one of those end uses, and we get solid carbon. So what happens is the longer hours of operation we have, the cleaner our technology becomes. It's not completely clean because of that startup stage, but we are stripping out carbon from the, um, from the, the grid. One third of emissions comes from the natural gas grid. And on the right side, you see our natural gas <coughs> pipeline is so far reaching that if we're able to decarbonize this, we're going to have a huge impact. On the left, you see all the end uses that I already talked about. And the carbon, the carbon's actually very exciting. Here are uh, a lot of modern asphalt uh, projects where we already have asphalt in the ground using uh, our carbon. And on the right, we have one of our investors, Bill Gates, who went over to headquarters and he was like, what can we do? What can I do? And we we're like, go fill a pothole. <laughs> uh, our carbon, and you can find that on, on socials. So coming back to this idea, you know, from this conversation, I think when I started talking, you were like, okay, great, let's all get, it. hopefully you're like, let's get on board with the opportunity space. What exists in there? There are a ton of technologies in there. Modern hydrogen is one. And we're getting pushback, and I'm not making this up. We have a project out in Oregon right now that's being attacked by the Sierra Club because we're using fossil fuels. I understand where they're coming from. I was a Sierra Club fan and great. But we are taking carbon out of our um, emissions. So, you know, we're right there in the middle. If you have any questions, my contact and our page, and that's kind of the problem we're facing right now. Thank you. All right. So questions, thoughts, ideas on the imperfect solutions and the transition to clean energy. So we are using, the idea is that the machine is created in a way that it can just plug into the pipeline of natural gas that exists in the U.S. and we can leverage that so we're actually not creating new infrastructure which also something not a lot of people talk about. But our units also work with renewable natural gas. Out in Washington we're using biogas from a dairy farm to produce uh, that. So when we use that, that biogas we're actually carbon negative, but we are realistic into that, you know, RNG and bio, um, it's very difficult to get and, you know, there's a bunch of other nuances there. So our starting point is we're going to leverage the, the natural gas pipeline itself that's already there and it's already exists, it's already working. Yep. 
Yeah, oh, how expensive is this technology compared to other ways to produce hydrogen? It's, uh, yeah, that's, that's number one question we got. Um, we use one eighth of what electrolyzers use in terms of uh, electricity. So, uh, and that's just for balance of planet, and we don't use any water. So our inputs are much cheaper than comparable clean uh, hydrogen solutions. And we are on the pathway to have $3 per kg of hydrogen by 2030 without any tax credits, because obviously everything's written for electrolyzers. Nobody likes to talk about us. Uh, and uh, also the carbon is another um, business unit. So that's without counting sales and carbon. That's a separate business unit. One more? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you talk a lot about the production. Can you talk about the selling, the demand side? How is it? Is it good? Are you getting a lot of demand? Um, you have a lot of clients. Yeah, so hydrogen is, is very attractive in the sense that everyone wants it. They just don't know. And I think we talked about this yesterday in the keynote that it's just hard to transport and it's hard to get to places. But we are producing it on site. So you kind of get that headache out of the way. And in terms of demand, what people don't, what I didn't appreciate at the beginning when I started working here is that hydrogen is already widely used. So there's kind of all these new applications like mobility and so on. Those are markets that are growing. But the U.S. already consumes a ton of hydrogen in industry. That's 30 hydrogen produced from carbon and steam methane reforming. So if we're able just to replace that hydrogen that's being used today into cleaner forms, there's already a very like robust market there. Maybe can you talk a little bit about how you offtake your projects? Um, are you doing like long term agreements? Are you more merchant? Um, like, you know, can you speak about that? Yeah, so there's kind of a, a bunch of different um, business models we can do in terms of like hydrogen as a service or more a capex play. I think it really depends on the end user just because there's a bunch of different considerations there are in terms of what's really most viable and more, uh, it's better for the client. So it, it really depends on there, but we have flexibility there. Great. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. All right. Keep your energy high. We've got a wonderful representative from Avant Grid, who we work closely with, Enrique, who's going to come up and pitch a problem from the perspective of our local utility partner. Thank you, Sue. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Enrique Bosch, and I'm the head of corporate innovation at Avangrid. Avangrid is uh, part of the Iberdrola Group, and I'm here today to talk about the challenge that we have, how we innovate in a company, in a clean energy company like, like Iberdrola. Um, so here you got some, some numbers on my back. Uh, we are a global company. We got operations in, in five continents. Um, we are the largest uh, wind power producer in the world. We... Depending on the week or the day, we are the second biggest utility. I think this week we are the third or the fourth. Uh, we serve more than 100 million people. And I work in innovation, and I'm very proud to say that we are one of the utilities that are spending or investing more in innovation, uh, around 400 million uh, per year. So you may ask, how do you innovate in, a, in, a, in this kind of companies? Uh, how do you create new things? How do you execute new, new projects? How do you evolve? Um, and basically, I, I have two, two uh, concepts I, I like to share. Uh, the first thing is that we, we, start, we started very early. So we started 20 years ago, uh, Iberdrola. 20 years ago, uh, wind energy and solar energy were, were uh, something from the lab. Uh, but the company started investing in renewable energy more and more, especially wind energy. Uh, we start divesting in coal and natural gas. And remember, 20 years ago, that was a, risk, a very risky move. Um, today, it's, it's much easier. Uh, and that was the, the origin of everything. And we are investing a lot of, in, in new technologies. We, are investing, we have invested more than $2 billion in the last decade in new technologies. And I'd like to, to share a few of them in a few minutes. Uh, but that's, that's one thing. Uh, but I think the strength of, of this company, of Iberdrola, is beyond that. Is the strength is that we are a global company. It's not in one single technology. It's not in one single uh, country or region. Our strength is that we are a, a global company. And we can share uh, lessons learned from an offshore wind project in the Baltic Sea, 
or we can share uh, problems or challenges that we have in electrification project here in Connecticut. So that's, that's, that's uh, the power that we have. And to be honest, I don't think there are many companies out there that can, can do that. We are uh, with 45,000 people uh, working together. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is that we, we understand diversity, and that's why we work with a very different uh, group of people, okay? So we work with a lot with the academia. We work with Yale, we work with MIT, we work with 20 universities here in the US. We work with national labs, we work with the DOE, uh, we work with associations, we work with startups. Um, we understand that's the way to bring new ideas, and to bring uh, value and working together, and again, share that knowledge that we can you know, spread uh, across all of our territories. So I'm gonna go very quickly to some of the uh, technologies that are keeping us busy today. Uh, one of them, I'm, I'm happy to say that we already been talking about hydrogen. Uh, we are focusing on green hydrogen. Uh, Iberdrola is, is heavily investing in green hydrogen because we see as a critical path to decarbonize some uh, uh, industrial processes like you know, chemicals or, or green steel. Um, we have the biggest uh, green hydrogen plant in operation in Europe, and we are developing a number of projects here in the US. And today I have one of my colleagues here in the audience. She is developing some of those projects, so you can reach out to her and learn more about what we are doing in green hydrogen here in the US. Um, the other one that is keeping us really busy is battery storage, uh, short duration, long duration. As you may understand, renewables uh, require, when you have a lot of penetration of renewables, you require energy storage of all ways, okay? Four hours, eight hours, 100 hours. So that's, that's a lot. We need to store the surplus energy that we produce with renewables when the sun is not shining or, or the wind is not blowing. Another area that you may be surprised is sustainable aviation fuel, and this is in the demand side. So we are not producing SAF uh, by ourselves, but we are working or at least assessing uh, some processes to produce e-fuels, synthetic fuels uh, from hydrogen uh, that we can apply in the transportation sector, especially in the aviation industry, okay? Um, I mentioned before that we are the largest uh, wind energy producer in the world. So you can imagine how many blades do we have? Uh, too many. Uh, so uh, one, definitely one area that we are innovating is uh, wind blade recycling. Um, how we reuse those blades in a sustainable way, how we prolong the lives. Um, there's an interesting story here. We are partnering with uh, one company from uh, Climate Heaven, um, you know, funded by Yale students, is Windloop. Um, we are partnering with them. Uh, they have a process to reuse, uh, I think it's something like 90, 90 something percent of the materials in the wind blades. Um, so we donated some blades uh, last year and we are running or, uh, a pilot this year. So very interesting thing uh, to, to, to keep an eye in the next few months. Um, offshore wind. Uh, you already mentioned about the, the, the Vineyard Wing One project. We are developing with CIP. Uh, this project is the, the first large-scale operation uh, wind farm, offshore wind farm in the US. Uh, to me, that's already innovation, but if you wanna go ahead uh, beyond that, I think the next step is floating offshore. Um, so Iberdrola is doing a, a lot of research in floating offshore that will allow us to, to go to deeper uh, regions where the wind is, is more is stronger and we have more uh, production and then the last thing is industrial decarbonization again partnering with the demand side with our partners industry partners help them helping them to meet their decarbonization targets so electrifying industry using hydrogen using uh, uh, thermal storage uh, you know all kind of technologies to uh, decarbonize their, their processes. So that's in a nutshell some of the technologies that we are working today. Uh, to be honest, there are many more. Uh, again, big company, many, many different business areas, but this is what is keeping us busy here uh, and in Avangrid in the US. 
Um, I think that, uh, as you see, I mean, Iberdrola and Abankis are not just focused on the challenges that we have in operation and, and, and the technologies that we are doing. We are, uh, we are building the, the clean energy future, so we are really uh, looking ahead. And we think innovation plays a critical role in, in decarbonizing the, our future. Okay, so if you have any questions about these technologies or, or any thoughts, uh, happy to hear. Thank you. Thank you. How does a global utility with a local presence in Connecticut innovate? So, yes? I just have a qu one question for you, which is how do you cite something like an offshore wind in a place like Tampa, Florida? In a place too? Like Tampa, Florida, which just had all these hurricanes. Would the hurricanes affect something like this? You want my honest opinion? Okay. We don't cite. We are not focusing on Tampa, Florida. We are not focusing in the. Uh, uh, in, the, in the Mexican Gulf, in the Texas area, because not just because of the uh, Milton is the, is the name of the hurricane, uh, it's because insurance. You're not going to find an insurance company insuring you the, the project. You guys know, you know as well as us. So now we're focusing in the Saudi Arabia of offshore wind, which is the northeast, is the best way to develop offshore wind projects in the U.S., and there are plenty of uh, leasing areas. Uh, we got many developers uh, doing. Is is the right way to focus now? Um, Tampa, we'll see. Uh, it's another, another story. Thank you. But you guys mentioned you have offshore wind farms in the Baltic Sea, and then we have offshore wind farms in the North Sea. These are experiencing hurricane-like winds on a regular basis. But I think unless the insurance industry catches up and understands that risk, they're going to attach a premium to it that makes it uneconomic for a company like Iberdrola or RWE to pursue. So I think that's where two industries kind of need to work closer together to understand how the changing climate can impact uh, both reinsurance and then standard kind of P&L insurance. Thank you. So who's, who's from the insurance industry? How do you innovate? We need you. Where are you at? <laughs> Not here. <laughs> Got to bring them into the room. Yeah. Yeah. Not, but through New York Climate Week, I spent a day with a group called Insure, I-N-N-S-U-R-E, that is looking to bring together energy transition technologies with the insurance industry. So I'm happy to connect you all to the group afterwards. Sure. Thank you. Yale Plug, Sarah Kane is also an amazing first-of-a-kind insurer um, who is a YSC SOM grad um, from 2004. So if you look her up on LinkedIn, you can find a very creative insurer. There's a bunch of like specialty yeah. underwriters now who are pairing up with the reinsurance companies to take on sort of unique risks in clean tech. Cool. Other questions? Comments? With, on your insurance comment, uh, I mean, a lot of these insurance companies are global. What's the difference that they will insure the North Sea for, for, versus Tampa? These projects are 20, 25, 30 years investment. Four billions, I would say, is the minimum. So who is going to insurance something that is going to be in the middle of the sea for 20 years when we are having events like the one we had last week every other year? Um, and by the way, I don't work in that area. I work in innovation, but that's the reason why we companies like us we have to invest billions and billions, and it's a very risk. Uh, it's a very risk option when you have other areas, not just in the U.S. but in the world, to really develop projects that are, you know, less risk, more profitable. Uh, you also need to look into energy prices by region. So Texas is not the best. It's, it's relatively cheap compared to the Northeast. So the economics work better here in the Northeast than. Over there. One more for the crowd. Yeah. Uh, Monica Gilbert from Linde. Um, I guess I have a couple of questions. One is, well, it seems like you, you support very strongly the green hydrogen production, right? But coming from Iberdrola, which traditionally, like, power generation based on natural gas, for example, especially in Europe, right, many years ago, why not something in between or supporting both options, blue hydrogen and green hydrogen? That, that's one of my, best, my, my first question. And the second one, have you, uh, have you experienced some of the challenges that your colleagues from RWE experienced in the rural areas uh, for the implementation of these renewable projects? Yes. And yes, uh, 
I'm going to give you the response for the two questions uh, mostly the same way. So in our view, the energy transition is happening, whether you like it or not. And that goes for the rural areas, for the urban areas, for any area. So that's one message that people normally don't understand. This is happening. You're going to have thousands of you know, renewable energy coming online in the next decades. And by the way, USA is not leading the field. So it's not like, hey, if I don't do it, it's not going to happen. No, it's happening everywhere. You go to Europe and you find many countries producing much more renewable energy than the U.S. You can blame China because of the battery price or whatever. Do whatever you want, but this is happening. So oh, if you don't invest in renewable energy, you don't invest in batteries, you're not going to be well behind in one or two decades. That goes for the rural areas. And then about your question about different technologies, it's true. Uh, we studied uh, many years ago carbon capture in some of our power plants. Uh, that was in Europe at the time. Uh, regulation in Europe for carbon capture was tricky. Uh, not much uh, public acceptance. And then many years ago, the decision was to uh, go 100% renewables. And in my opinion, I'm not saying renewables are the solution for everything. It's not the, sol the silver bullet that you mentioned. But in my opinion, it's 80% of the solution. And we are in a, real, in a real moment of urgency. So we don't have to find the perfect solution, but I think we should execute as soon as possible the 80% 80, the 80 that we can execute. And then in the road, we will find ways to decarbonize the rest of the industry. Thank you. Thank you so much. So with this prompted some ideas, some thoughts, you now know some of the people who have problems that are out there. They're all going to grab lunch and get food and fuel up for the next session. So find them if you've got things and compliments or ideas for them to share. Please do so. And lunch is downstairs. Thank you.